If you've been active on Nintendo YouTube in the past year or two, I'm sure you've come across a video that looks a little something like this. An iconic album cover that's been poorly photoshopped to include elements of old video games on them with a title that generally says something along the lines of blank, but in the Super Mario 64 sound font. These videos feature faithful renditions of popular songs using no other than the sounds and instruments found from said old video games. Have you ever wanted to hear what Nirvana's Nevermind would sound like if it was brutally bit crushed into an N64 cartridge? Okay, I mean, I mean, me neither, but it, it exists now if you want to listen to it. And it's not just Nirvana. This trend has nearly infected every corner of popular music media. I mean, there's Donkey Kong, Demon Day, System of a Down, Banjo-Kazooie, Kanye West, Mario, and then there's a Seinfeld theme, but instead it's like a weird splicing of the slap bass to recreate the Doom theme. I'm, I'm not even sure this one... Counts. But despite their silly demeanor, these mashups have garnered quite the following on YouTube as of late. And I believe it's due to their ability to invoke a sense of gaming-related nostalgia while also appealing to wider music nerddom. But what exactly is it that's making us feel this specific nostalgia? And, you know, while we're at it, what the actual f is a sound font? To answer these questions and to hopefully get a better understanding of why I can't stop sobbing to this cover of a goddamn DuckTales song, we have to go back to the very beginning of sound font history, starting in the 90s. What we do here is go back, 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 back. But for context, before the 90s and before sound fonts even fucking existed, digital audio engineering was often regarded as a huge pain in the ass to work with. If you wanted to compose a soundtrack for a computer program back in the day, you were often met with what me and the boys like to call a massive fucking clunk. At the time, synthesizers were a very popular choice for digital composition, but relatively their range of sound was very, very limited. You either got a square noise or a triangle noise, and if you didn't fuck with it, you could take it up with Bill Gates. But despite these obstacles, these things weren't impossible to get done. And consoles like the NES and the Atari 7800 would use their own custom sound chips to make audio comprised of these triangle and square noises, forming what would later become known as the chiptune genre. But soon enough, moving into the 90s, with the SNES, we would get the invention of sound fonts. And to finally give a definition to what sound fonts actually are. They're basically a collection of recordings that can be pitch shifted with MIDI controls to make different compositions of music. So instead of customizing a waveform to make it sort of sound like a fart noise, you could actually record a live fart noise and manipulate it to be whatever pitch you desire. Nowadays, this is a pretty basic concept for music production, but back in the day, this was fucking revolutionary. It provided a convenient and accessible way to access high quality sounds and samples, which previously was pretty goddamn hard to do. But to put it in terms, the average Andy can understand, it's the reason why all these tracks exist and sound the way that they do. Composers like Koji Kondo and David Wise would end up writing original scores for these video games on piano and then end up programming them note by note into the consoles using this said technology. Though oftentimes this process would end up compressing the sound and giving the console versions of these tracks that cheap and plasticky aesthetic we all know and love. But even then, programmers found their own unique way to weasel out of the shit and just add a bunch of reverb to certain sections to mask the technological constraints. Now, if only we could do this to people we don't like. Yeah, yeah, like, like, imagine, like, people, like, walking around, but, like, you can't, you can't hear them, because they're, like, like, they're, they're, like, the reverb, like, it's, like, spit fucking sucks. So what happened? Why did we move away from sound fonts, and what did we do to replace them? Well, if you're looking for a real answer, the technology just kind of outgrew them. During the 16 to 64 bit era, memory constraints were a very big problem and sound fonts made a lot of sense because, well, they didn't use a lot of it. However, as consoles became more beefy and capable of handling these larger file sizes, the need for this compactness and simplicity decreased. It's why consoles like the PlayStation 1, which utilized disk based technology, got away with using high quality soundtracks for most of their games. Meanwhile, the N64 was stuck with 4 megabytes of RAM and a thumb up its ass. And while sound fonts are still used occasionally for games to try to recreate retro aesthetics, they've now been largely abandoned by the gaming industry, which is honestly probably for the best. Because despite how charming they are, I think I'd genuinely off myself if I had to listen to Joel die using some crunchy MIDI shifted rendition of a sound effect. Oh, fuck me, man. I hope Joel doesn't die. Come on. Oh, fuck. Come the I fuck on. I can't fucking believe this. However, nostalgia is a bitch. So let's talk about this old music and why the internet loves to celebrate it in the weird way that it does. It's no secret that retro video game music has a Vulcan death grip on the heartstrings of nerdy college students. Yet the question still remains.
Why? There's no doubt old video games are nostalgic. I mean, the last time I saw a physical copy of Chrono Trigger, my appendix burst, but why is it that out of every single soundtrack medium, video games hit us the hardest? I mean, no offense to The Shining or Star Wars, but I'm not seeing any Everlong remixes to sound like the Duel of Fates. Something about video game OSTs just hit different. And I believe there's an actual good reason for this that's not just Mario got me through my parents' divorce. And that's because video game music doesn't orchestrate itself like regular music does. These soundtracks usually have to loop in the background of your gameplay for a long, long ass time. Could be 20 minutes, could be fucking hours. Regardless, the composers of these pieces have to make sure that these songs have lasting replay value and don't get old after the fourth, fifth, or even hundredth time you've listened to them. And that's just something that movie and TV soundtracks don't have to worry about. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm jamming to Ghostbusters as much as the next guy on Halloween, but an eight hour road trip with, with just Ghostbusters? Yeah, I'd be finished. I'd be much more relaxed with something along the lines of C418's Minecraft soundtrack, which consists of a very calming loop of melodies that never seem to get old in the context of, well, anything. I could just listen to it for eight hours straight, and honestly, most nights I fucking do. I wouldn't say I have insomnia or anything crazy like that, but most nights I do find it difficult to sleep without some kind of background noise. And most nights, my first choice for that background noise is Minecraft. So to me, it makes complete sense why we have an overattachment to these kinds of styles of songs. Some may call it Stockholm Syndrome, but to me, this shit is holy fucking peak. But I guess that's just my experience. I grew up with Minecraft, therefore I'm pretty fond of the OSD. So for someone else who may have grown up on the sounds of Donkey Kong Country or Final Fantasy, I completely understand the appeal. It's the same thing, just different generations of people. Of course I want to hear what Buddy Holly would sound like in the background of Bob on Battlefield. Of course I want to hear free bird while I'm dashing down the circuits of Mario Kart. Of course, I want all these things. And here they are, available to everyone through the power of sheer boredom and the internet. Mashup culture has existed for a very long time outside of this very specific genre on YouTube, but it's still nice to see that the work of these old programmers and composers are living on through dumb bullshit like this. And hopefully by watching this video, you learned a thing or two about music production or game design that you didn't know before. And uh, let me know if you guys want more videos akin to shit like this. I'm already kind of going through an identity crisis and I'm dealing with all the repercussions of uploading whatever random bullshit I want. So fuck it. Just, just let me know what you want and uh, subscribe. I think, I think that's the thing that YouTubers say at the end of their videos. Okay, now get out. You can fucking get out. You can fucking get out. Get the fuck out of my channel. Get the fuck out of here.